Two wins, six points, Norwich City in touching distance of the Championship top six. Easy week. No, nothing to discuss whatsoever from, uh, from, from that week, although I suspect there will be plenty. Uh, I'm your host, Connor Southwell, joined by Adam Harvey and Paddy Davitt on this week's edition of the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast, brought to you uh, with our sponsors, Coleman's of Norwich. What a week, Paddy, for Norwich City. What we were worried about, you know. <laughs> this is a playoff grade team and they're proving it. And uh, funny enough, we just walked back up the hill now from, from the Cardiff sort of game and spoken to David Wagner and, and took him back to maybe an hour or two on now, but this time last Saturday night when we was in the media room at QPR, that felt like a defeat, but it was a point, but frustrated all round. And his answer was kind of, well, if we now back it up with the next two home games and, and get maximum points, then that'll look like a good point. And it does look like a good point. And eight goals into the bargain, eight goals scored and... And so many positive strands within that, as you would expect when you've put two teams away by those margins, that uh, it's, it's all there for them now. Yes, we'll get into the, the weeds of it and like a John Rowe scenario, that, that's that's a blow for what's to come now. But but he underlined it again today and we'll get into that in due course. But you keep Josh Sargent fit, you've got a chance. And where they are now compared to pertinently because it was the Cardiff away game in mid-November um, where I think he was on the precipice, David Wagner, Adam Eder, that very late salvo in a game they were looking like they were going to get beat in and to, to move it on to this game and and how much better they looked than Cardiff and, you know, underlining again this week, um, this is a group of players who they can be all pointed in the right direction and, you know, under a head coach who, who clearly, and we'll get into it at this point as well after the, the events of the Watford game, but has, has those players playing for him. Absolutely no doubt about that. And they believe in his methods. And um, you can only, you can only do what's in front of you. And, and the two teams who've, who've come to Cairo Road this past four or five days have been sent packing. And, uh, you know, it's all there for them now. And, um, and I don't think probably, bar the most ultra-optimistic Norwich fan, felt... Going back to that period around the Cardiff win, seven defeats in nine, um, that this would have been possible at this stage. So, huge testament to David Wagner and his coaches and those players have pulled it together. And um, you know, you have to feel at this point uh, there is a, a momentum building, and uh, it feels like it's going to take him into the top six. Before we go any any further, um, just want to clear up in terms of Borja Science last week, definitely booked. Uh, well, so the FA say. I'm still, <laughs> I, I'm still waiting for the EFL. Yeah, to be fair, in that segment that you're referring to, Connor, on last week's episode, where we were quite scathing, it was all ultimately going to be either incompetence from Norwich as a coaching staff or incompetence from the officials. Very happy to report it was incompetence from the officials. Although David, I mean, when we put it to him pre-match against QPR, he said, "Yeah, the fourth official did mention to them in play that Borja Science had got a, a yellow card." So. Not sure why then, if the officials were aware of it, why it, there was no record documented of an actual yellow card. But um, happy to report it wasn't incompetence on part of David Wagner and his coaching team. So it's a win-win all round. Dog and duck officiating rather than coaching. Or <laughs> well, uh, what's the, where are we going with this, Connor? <laughs> I mean, you know, ultimately at that point when we recorded it, it was, well, there's nothing here in any official reports that suggests Borja Science was booked. So... Uh, we did what we needed to do and cleared it up through the FA. And uh, yeah, but if we want to open up this can of worms, it's uh, to me that still doesn't um, uh, explain why you don't throw Van Hoy on gone because obviously, you know, fair enough science and Hernandez, but he then subsequently after that point brought on McCallum, took off Yanulis, who was involved midweek, wasn't he, against Watford. So we'll come back to subs, I think. We will, but yeah, uh, but yeah. It, Still questions for me around what unfolded against QPR, but we don't need to go there now because we're sitting here looking pretty uh, off the back of seven points out of nine, so roll on. Yeah, Adam, I, um, we'll come back to, I think, the, the fan element of it uh, a little bit later on and we'll talk a little bit more in depth about what happened this week and um, less so, you know, reopening that particular can of worms, but but maybe in, in, a, in a little little bit of a different context. But, you know, I, I left Carrow Rose the other night um, feeling quite sad, really, that you know uh, what had unfolded, but but you contrast that with today, 
where the fans were excellent, I thought, and, and they were, you know, they were, if you slot that game two weeks ago, three weeks ago, and Norwich concede first, it's probably a very different reaction to what it got today. And actually, it, it, the biggest compliment I think you can give to the fans, but also to the team in their performances, it didn't really affect anything when, when Cardiff took the lead. I mean, Carroll Road hasn't, for bulk of this season, I would say, been a particularly happy place to watch football. It was a very happy place today. Yeah, I actually kind of looked at the numbers in the lower Barkley when they sort of after the game and the the players went over for their their wave with David Wagner. And the other night there was a lot of sort of sparse areas where you could see fans that had already gone today, but you'd have struggled to have picked that a seat. It was like everyone all there together um, to give the, the players and, and David Wagner himself the credit they deserved because you know that was a a really top performance. And even when they went one 0 down today, you know you mentioned it, the atmosphere was was still there. You'd have almost thought Norwich were the team that had taken the lead, but. You know, it, it all boils down to kind of what they're doing on the pitch. The, the fans are you know, enjoying what they're watching at the moment, and that obviously helps the, the whole scenario. But, um, you know, there's 13 huge games to go now, and it feels like if they can keep this unity and they can get the fans fully on side for, for these big games, um, something you know special could happen, and, and that's what you need. I, I think, you know, any player that's been involved in a promotion push out of the Championship knows how much the, the fans are that 12th man. and. You know, at times of the season, I don't think you can criticise the Norwich fans. You know, you go back to those games against Blackburn at home. There was nothing there for them to get behind. So I think the atmosphere at those games was, was fully justified. But um, in the here and now, yeah, that was uh, probably the best atmosphere of the season. Um, the feeling afterwards, the buzz. Um, I can imagine everyone's gone home and is watching the highlights. You know, they're enjoying what they're seeing at the moment. And, and yeah, long may it continue because um, if it does, Norwich could be in the top six. Yeah, and, and just to touch upon what Adam said there, I think you know you described it as the best atmosphere of the performance. I think I'd go best performance of the season in terms of the complete, maybe in terms of a full ninety. We've seen this Norwich team perform in bursts at points, and um, and, and then you know regress like, um, within games, and we kind of have these really kind of low points and real high points as well. Often that's game by game, and it, and within games as well. We kind of saw it a little bit on Tuesday night where they started brilliantly for the first 30, then we had a real dip and then they picked it up again to win the game. This was a very straight line, consistent performance. Cardiff were poor, but Norwich made them look poor, I felt, at points. Um, and I guess that shows, Paddy, the growth of this, this side over the last few weeks. There has been not just improved results, which we saw earlier on in the season, but they weren't necessarily being backed up by performances. Now it feels like maybe for the first time this season, they've kind of achieved both. Yeah, but I mean, you cannot dismiss how poor Cardiff were, as poor as side as I've seen Norwich play this season. Um, but having fallen behind, you know they, they were emboldened and uh, that didn't make it any easier. And yes, that, that's fair. I think I, I can't recall Huddersfield away was pretty complete and pretty comprehensive in the same fashion. But uh, at Carra Road, yeah, I mean you know only go back recent games, you know West Brom and Coventry wins, but both of those teams had plenty of spells in the game uh, and Watford had that spell midweek as well albeit the results still went in Norwich's favour so yes but um, you can't escape that they looked an incredibly poor side so but you know it was Cardiff this weekend it'll be Blackburn next weekend and a few links in the chain it'll be the likes of Leicester and, and Ipswich so if we're getting this level of performance today that we see in those big, big games against two of the top four, then, uh, then absolutely, then you have you have to say that is irrefutable evidence that finally David Wagner would appear to have extracted, you know, not only individual elements from very talented players in the main, but but also that collective, and uh, you know that is probably what it's going to take because I. It, f it didn't feel a sustainable policy to get them into the top six and then obviously then progress out of the top six by the playoffs to rely on John Rowe doing yeah. what he needed to do or Josh Sargent now increasingly so, or Zara. Um, this feels a bit more of a cohesive strategy and controlled strategy as well. And I, for me, you know, seeing a player like Nunes in there, I think now alongside Zara, that seems to be working far better in terms of trying to control a game, trying to control the tempo of a game and not this kind of basketball feel of we'll have a spell on top and then we'll you know seemingly not know what we're doing for the next however many minutes and that's what we saw midweek, wasn't it? So And I've seen too often. But today, yeah, you couldn't argue for a minute one to, and, the, and the possession stats and the shots on, shots off, they all heavily tilted in Norwich's favour. So, yep, they got it spot on today. 
Yeah, and I, I thought, just to add to that, Adam, I mean, it seems like there's been a real improvement in terms of their off-the-ball work of late. The, the counter-press work that they, they did today was, was excellent. It feels like there's more energy about them as, as a side, but, but also kind of in possession, there was much more of a balance about them today. I mean, Marcelino Nunez, I, I felt, was kind of the standout from that midfield area, but... You know they got real joy out of both flanks because of their their, their fullbacks mainly. Sam McCallum in an attacking sense was was excellent first half. Jack Stacey who who is in a real purple patch I think at the moment three assists um, in, in in as many games. Just just again these slight tweaks that we've made that it's it's a level of performance. This what we saw against Coventry and West Brom as well that I, I probably didn't see coming in December. And it just feels like maybe as Paddy said for the first time he struck upon a system and a balance as well that is suited to this Norwich City eleven at the moment. Yeah, I, th I think the hunger and desire of the players, you can see, has, has gone up a level as well. I mean, there's moments today where you had three or four Norwich players surrounding the Cardiff player on the ball to, to get it back. And um, it's almost a belief that once they get one goal, they get two, they get three. Uh, where before, you know, they, you, know you mentioned it, they, they were a team completely built on, on moments of quality from individual players, where now they feel like, uh, as a unit, they're a much better side. Um, I think the influence of someone like Ashley Barnes, who looked like a you know, completely different player probably a couple of months ago. I mean, now he looks like a, you know, a man on a mission who's going to try and help them, you know, push up the division. Of course, Josh Sargent is crucial for what they're doing. We, we've mentioned him on so many occasions and two goals again today. And I think you mentioned his, his sort of goals per, per minute ratio. It's, it's up there and probably the best in the championship, to be honest. Um, God knows what would have happened if he'd have been fit all season and where they could be now. But um, yeah, they, they, they just look a much better coach side and, and that, obviously clearly deserves um, credit to the likes of Nasha Pelash and Christian Buhler and those that work with them on, on a daily basis because clearly something's been spoken about at Colney um, because they look like a, a much better side. It's much better to watch. The system is much better. Um, you know, None of this kind of negative five at the back or whatever we saw at different points where they were just trying to purely get a result and they were relying on those those players to, to get them over the line in certain games. Um, this feels like a sustainable way forward um, and I think if they continue playing the way they are and then keep everyone fit you know I mean of course Johnny Rowe's a big blow but the fact that you're not even noticing that he's not in this side at the moment is um, is a credit to those that are playing um, and long may it continue as I, as I mentioned on, on the last answer because it's um, it's an enjoyable place to go at the moment Cow Road and even those travelling on the road I'm sure they'll all be you know, looking forward to a trip to Blackburn rather than, um, you know, dreading uh, all the miles that will be involved in that trip. Yeah, indeed. And I think for as much as you speak about the collective and the collective growth, and, and, it, and it's, it's subtle things, it's subtle tweaks, and that earlier on in the season, both fullbacks would go at the same part, at the same time, which is why they, they got in so much trouble in, in, in transition. Now it's just one will go and one will... And it's, and it's so basic, yeah. but it's made such a difference to the balance and the structure of, uh, of the side. And w when they press as well, they're doing that a lot more intelligently and with a lot more purpose than, than they were. And, um, you know, they're doing some really good stuff in terms of how they're kind of using the touchline in their favour as a bit of a, 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 of a trap. And all, all of these are just small, subtle tweaks that have really improved them as a side. And, and uh, you know, as I said at the start, you, you you touched upon the collective improvement, but there's there's been real individual pr improvement as well, Paddy. And we could probably list, in fact, we have Nunez, Stacey. We we could list four or five players that over the last few weeks just seem to have turned the dial up a little bit in in, in their own individual performances. Well, it was interesting on Stacey when we put that to him, David Wagner, after the game. Uh, he basically attributed a lot of that. We're now seeing the Jack Stacey who first walked in the door, uh, who was very good in August, early September. That post that festive period, um, he went and had you know, the best part of a week off. Just told him, to, and I don't think he was the only one. Uh, he didn't reference what who the other players were, but there was a group of players who he felt clearly they looked at their minutes to that point of the season and felt there was flagging. And and we, I think we'd all agree Jack Stacey's performance levels not the only one, but um, but uh, declined markedly from that peak when he first came through the door when he looked uh, how on earth have Bournemouth let this lad go because he looks an excellent addition and and there's no doubt he, there is a freshness about how he's operating now you know that engine to get up and down the park to be in those positions I mean we talked about on the way way home uh, way back to the office tonight that the, the, the quality of the ball in for Sargent but you've got to be in that position you've got to be on the front foot an aggressive and a high starting position and to do that you've got to physically feel you can at this stage of a championship season still have enough fuel in the tank and uh, so that's clever that's good management that's good management for Wagner and his coaches and his sports science staff that they've maybe looked at the numbers post that festive swing and had the opportunity maybe around those Bristol ties to just uh, as I say let a few players put their feet up 
metaphorically and um and now it's paying off and uh and of course confidence is is huge and tangible and you and you can see that they look at confidence set of players now and why shouldn't they be you know look at the form line since that Cardiff away game look at the teams they've they've claimed scalps from now the West Broms the Coventrys the Halls Watford in midweek um you know, teams were in and around them with the same sort of ambitions and Norwich have more often than not fell the right side of it. That breeds confidence as well. And then you overlay it now with they're scoring goals, they're playing well. It isn't a reliance on an individual to do something within a team collective that is maybe second best. I, I, my mind goes back to that Hull away game. Mm. They, they were, were not a better team than Hull that night in terms of control of the game and the, the style and their identity of what they were trying to do. But they just had in that night, that night obviously it was Johnny Rowe primarily, but... Um, but now they look like they can put something on the part that it was is far more cohesive and far more based on the collective rather than individuals. And of course, within that, they have still very good quality. And the goal scorers today, you know, principally uh, Sergeant and, and Sara, they are as good as any in their positions in the championship. And Norwich have one or two others who I'd put in that bracket, Angus Gunn. Um, sadly, Johnny Rose unavailable, but he's as good as maybe maybe some of those Leeds players are excellent. But you've got the individual talent there. What they didn't have hitherto until this point, it's felt, is a template which is week to week residually effective that they can go home way and they can go from home and pick up points and play well while doing that. And um, and they're there now, and you just hope that they're in this groove now and with that confidence that's behind them that they can just roll on. They'll obviously need a little bit of luck now with injuries to, to some of the key players who are available now. Um, and if they get that, you know, momentum is a massive thing at this stage of the season and Norwich very definitely have it. And I think what you said there and, and also what, what Adam said as well leans into why this, this run feels a little bit different from the ones that we saw earlier on in the season. It feels a lot more sustainable, um, like you say, because, of course, in football you are always going to be... Uh, reliant upon individual brilliance to an extent and even you know the Norwich City title winning sides in the two championship seasons under Daniel Farker think about Emi Buendia I think about Temu Puki at points have had that individual brilliance but it's it's also about accompanying it with a structure because if you have a structure it means you're not dependent on it you're not you know not everything is geared towards we need this player to produce a moment or we don't win a game that's kind of what it's felt like at points this season. Now, as you say, you've taken Johnny Rowe out of that. And at a point in this season, that would have been so detrimental to what they were doing. At the moment, it's it, it hasn't really thrown them off course. Whether obviously it catches up with them as, as, as time goes, we'll see. But um, if you can achieve a consistency in terms of structure and in terms of process, then you can add individual brilliance to that rather than being reliant upon it. And I think that's that's the difference. And, and actually, you, you look at some of the goals they scored today. The, the the third goal that Josh Sargent put away, excellent team move, um, you know, and, and Gabriel Sarah's free kick is, is probably an ind uh, although it was deflected, it was a bit of uh, individual individual quality. The fourth goal as well, even though that's come obviously from a from a turnover, the the, the way that Fashnax brought that down, and then the way they've combined the, the quality from Van Hoydonk, who, you know, is a striker at a new club, I think you could have forgiven him if he'd have tried to add a shot at that game and uh, and open his tally, but was patient, found. Uh, the moment, I guess, to turn what was a good chance into a great chance to, to score that goal. I mean, the, the, their decision-making and the quality that they're showing in all in all thirds, really, but particularly that, that final third, seems to have really kind of slipped up a gear in recent weeks. Yeah, I think the quality as well off the bench. You know, you mentioned kind of the the initial structure, but I mean, Christian Fashnat, that's two goals now in, in the last two games. Well, are, we, are we giving him the Watford one? <sighs> Well, I mean, based on the fact that I think it's been registered as his goal, it's, you know, I've got to give it to him. But Are we trusting the EFL, though? I trust you know. the EFL, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I think that, that impact, I mean, McCallum with yeah. the assist for, or helping up in the assist for the, the, the winner against Coventry, and those impact players off the bench, I mean, you, you mentioned the, the Farker title winning season, Mario Vrancic was a bit like that, where he just came off the bench and he knew he could do something. But, um, yeah, it, the quality all over in terms of um, the build-up play for goals and the sort of goals they're scoring that, you know, the, the different types of goals, they're not all the same. Um, and yeah, that finish from Fashnak was, was superb. And, and Josh Sargent, you know, he's probably a little bit gutted he didn't get a hat trick today. You know, he had a couple of. He, uh, so, so I spoke to him after, we'll come on to him in a, in a minute or two. He described his performance today as sloppy. But, you know, I think that's probably probably a good good you know barometer for Norwich that they've got players that are feeling disappointed, even though they've scored two goals, because um, he knows he's, you know, probably the, the chance the first chance he had where it was basically on a plate for him anywhere else but where he put it he, he's going to find the back of the net um, but yeah that only bodes well for, for Norwich moving forwards but um, 
you know, you mentioned that the link up play from Van Hooydonk, I mean, that is a, you know, man, as you mentioned, he could have easily had a shot, try and um, get off the mark in, in, in Norwich, um, Norwich colours. And the ability and the awareness to know where Fashnak was about to make the run is, um, that again is a crucial for him and his confidence as an assist as well. Um, that will bode well for him moving forwards. And I mean, I'm hoping to see more of him between now and the end of the season. But yeah, I, th I think the quality of, of the goals today um, and probably to fair over, over recent weeks has, has definitely gone up and, and the consistency that they're scoring goals as well. You know, they're not just relying on one goal. It is literally now putting teams to uh, to bed early on and not having that kind of that stress, I suppose, as, as naturally as, uh, as fans do, where you kind of waiting for the whistle to, to come today felt was probably as comfortable as I've felt all season, you know, throughout the whole 90, really. Even when they were 1-0 behind, I, I backed them to, to go and win the game quite comfortably because they looked the, the better side and um, they nailed the 4-1 the prediction that I predicted pre-match on the preview show. He's been itching to get that in. Like he's, been, he's, been, he, he, he's now content just to go home. He's done now in terms of the podcast. So that's 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 good. Um, Josh Sargent, Paddy, I, I think, you know, it'd be remiss of us not, not to talk about him. 10 goals in... In 13 championship games, he's only completed two of those. Uh, and, and both of those were in August, I think. I think he played 90-plus against Coventry, but, but came off pretty um, pretty late on. He, he's, he is, as you said, one of the, the best strikers in, 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 in the division. But, but also, you know, and I wrote about this in, in a column, actually, on this morning. He is a... a, a, a pretty complete striker. There's not very many of those around at, at the moment. And you see what he adds to Norwich City and, and obviously what he, you know, and, and I think we even saw it today when he goes off the pitch, they look a really different team and, and not in a better sense and, and not necessarily in a worse sense, but definitely different. Um, and that's a testament, I guess, to, to his qualities. He said post-match, this is really his, his first season since he, since he became a pro, that he's, he's kind of been able to play as a striker and, and you can see that reflecting in the numbers. I mean, even with managing an injury, this is quite an incredible production that, or sort of output that he's producing at, at this moment in time. It is, but but that's an important point that maybe for the first time in his career, and even this season now, has been punctuated by a thick end of four months with that ankle layoff. But but it but it's almost he's he's been on this journey and he's he's kind of crossed over now from a potential. Um, got all the attributes you you would need to be a decent striker at a decent level in a European league to he's actually it's almost maturity isn't it you know he's now grown into himself he's understanding his game the tactical elements that David Wagner has spoken about about him not just his you know his athleticism which is there for all to see um but tactically I think he's quite astute now and it's and it and he must feel within himself because you can see that the way he's going out on a pitch and carrying himself that yeah he knows um I can do it at this level and of course now the next question you hope it's in a green and yellow shirt is can he go on and do it at highest level because clearly when he first came in it was part of that Premier League era under the Stuart Webber and uh, and Timu Puki was a major immovable object um, even a Timu Puki who wasn't the Timu Puki of the first time round in the Premier League so he probably didn't feel he he really put his stamp on it as I am a Premier League grade striker but he, he he's now even in an abbreviated season, uh, I think it was indisputably is better than this this level. And uh, and again, it goes back to the confidence point, particularly young players as well. And he is still a young man. You remember, you have to for, you forget that because maybe because he he left America very early and went to Germany, and maybe it feels he's been around longer than he has. But you know, he he now is looking like. Whereas Puki was the main man, he is now the main, main man. But in, crucially, he believes he's the main man. And it's like, I will lead this. I will drive this attacking unit forward. Put the responsibility on me. I can take it. I'm going to show you that I want to be the man. And um, and his teammates would, would probably concur that he is, you know, he is the figurehead in terms of what they're trying to do as an attacking unit. You put a Norwich team on the park with him in it and one without and the contrast it's night and day and and the results over this course of this season would underline that um, but I mean well, you know you spoke to me again about it. the only concern you have now is you know he is managing this ankle related issue and um, you know David spoke pre-match about from sort of almost one training week to another they just don't, they don't know is he going to be able to go to the well and will he be able to go it deep into games because there's absolutely no doubt between now and what Norwich have lying ahead he will need to be 
able to go to the well week in, week out, um, ideally for 90 minutes at a time. So that's, of course, a concern that, you know, the last two weeks now, he's not trained until the Friday before QPR and then before today's game as well. How, how long can you get away with managing a, a guy like that if he's he's not fit enough to be on the training pitch week in, week out? It's not, it's not impacting him when he gets on the... On the pitch in the last few games, but we'll like catch up with him. So that that's one that you would have to be slightly concerned about. Ledley King made a career out of that, didn't he? Just just never trained. Yeah, true, true. But uh, a bit different in terms yeah. of their, where they are in their respective careers, though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but but you're right. I, sp I spoke to him post match, and it was interesting. It was um, he, he basically said, obviously, it's an ankle that he's had a major operation on. But he even said. You know, I know Wagner said week to week, but he said day to day it can it can change. You can wake up one morning and uh, have kind of like a dull aching sensation. Sometimes it can be real pain, and and then he can have days like he said today where he feels absolutely fine. He doesn't feel anything, and it's just about what well, a <laughs> how you manage that, but also long term how you find a solution to that as well. And um, you know, hopefully they can they can do that. Whether it is as simple as rest, and obviously the fact now that Norwich are going to go for a few weeks, I think until. We have that Sunderland Middlesbrough swing where they've got a couple of weeks now where they've got four weeks between games. So you'd hope that that would that would help him and would enable him to probably take a little bit longer for that recovery and um, manage his load a little bit differently. But you're right that I think that is a concern. But on the flip side, Adam, the fact that he's producing what he's producing, uh, I don't want to say on one leg because he's not on one leg, but uh, <laughs> not at the peak of his powers. So incredibly impressive, as, as Paddy said, for a player who. Really, when he came in, there was one stage he was he was almost a kind of a joke figure, really, because of that miss against Brighton and where he was in the Premier League cycle and he wasn't ready when, when he came in. But you did feel, because of his physicality and the profile that he has, if he could get himself on a, on a run, he would very quickly look at a very, very good striker, as, as he is at this moment in time. Yeah, yeah, I think the energy levels were always there, but it was kind of um, extracting the best out of him. When now he feels like the complete striker... He, it doesn't really feel like there's that many weaknesses in his game. I mean, there was a leap today. I mean, his ability mm. to, to leap um, and, and, you know, head, head home goals now. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't look like the biggest of strikers, but, you know, his ability from being able to get off the ground is um, probably up there in terms of the best I've seen, uh, you know, in terms of championship strikers. Definitely, um, you know, that, that probably pushes him towards the Premier League grade. And, um, yeah, it's all types of goals as well now with him. It's not just, you know, sort of that, that finish in them when he gets through, you know, makes those runs in behind, and he's found by someone, and he, you know, he angles the ball in the corner like you expect him to do. But it is headers now. It's you know he's finding himself in pockets of space, and he's been able to impact play. And the link up plays I got with Ashley Barnes is um, that looks like a really good relationship, which we saw probably to be fair at the start of the season, and then both of them obviously have had their their injury issues, and they've been in and out of the team at different points. But um, I think as long as Norwich can keep those two fit and continue, you know, the system they're in, then. Um, that feels like it's going to benefit both of them because you know Barnes had a goal ruled out today, and you know I think he's starting to look like a, a threat now in terms of goals as well. So it's all boding well, and as you say, the fact that Josh Sargent is not 100%, and we're still getting these levels from him um, consistently, you know, um, week in week out in the championship, and um, he, he's already pushing himself up the the goal scoring table in the championship in terms of top goal scorers, and you know, for a man who's basically been missing for two-thirds of the campaign um, that pretty much proves where he is at the moment um, it's not you know kind of that like maybe last season where he got in the first half of the season where he was banging in goals left right and centre but it felt like you know maybe it wasn't consistent into the second half of the season and almost a little bit of a purple patch this feels like it's a much like Norwich at the moment very sustainable um, his goal output and yeah, for as long as he continues this, then there's definitely going to be some Premier League clubs um, sniffing in the summer. So hopefully Norwich can uh, get themselves in the top six and, and end it with promotion. And he could go and prove himself in the Premier League with Norwich City again after, you know, last time. Maybe not getting that opportunity. And he's developed obviously a lot in terms of him personally and, and his game since then as well. Yeah, and, and that last point that, that you raised, Paddy, is, is a pertinent one, isn't it? Because... You know, I've, I wrote about this this morning and got accused of uh, almost putting him in a shop window, which wasn't my intention. But there is a real lack in world football. And, and you listen to top coaches, Gareth Southgate, if you want to call him a top coach, which, are, you know, he's managed England and taken them to a major final. So you could probably put him in that bracket. But Arsene Wenger at FIFA has done kind of a big study into this and, and has kind of spoken about his concern, particularly in, in younger age group of strikers, about how 
sort of few and far between these kind of complete number nines in the conventional sense are now because of maybe academies and, and, and the gear towards possession based football and how you know certain players, Jürgen, uh, certain coaches, sorry, Jurgen Klopp has kind of uh, played with false nines over the years, and so strikers have changed and evolved and adapted. And you know there is now a, a probably a, a, a bigger demand as there ever was for these number nines, but they're probably few and far between. Josh Sargent is one, and of course I'm not talking about him in terms of the upper echelons of of striker, but but definitely in terms of Premier League grade with the with the, the clubs that will be looking for that this summer. You, you would imagine that his name would, would appear naturally on, on, on quite a few short lists. Yeah, as you're talking now, I'm just trying to think. Top, I'm not saying he's, he's A, ready for top end Premier League or is going to be on the radar of top end, but I'm looking, I'm thinking of the Tottenham's and the Arsenal's and the type of strikers they have. And yeah, you, you're right, it's not a Kane... Well, used to be this, Kane, this Kane Lewandowski, those type yeah. of But they're, they're older kind of players, Benzema yeah. as well, Lewandowski. I mean, these these are players who are 30 plus really. But isn't but isn't that essentially saying that's where the game is? That That's the that's the direction that the top coaches have taken the game. The Guardiola's of this world, he plays with a false nine as well, doesn't he? Um, or has done on occasion. But largely that's because, again, well, since Haaland. Yeah, but isn't it coaches leading it? Isn't it coaches leading that trend partly, rather than that's... That's a result of academy football and how it's gone. Yeah, but again, I think there's this. So it's a bit of you know this and that, isn't it? There's, there's an element of that, but there's also an argument that that is being done because there aren't as many of these strikers available. Like you said, they're all kind of a of an older age. I'm thinking um, Victor is it Victor Osiman, who's yeah, at, yeah. at Napoli. Yeah. He feels like the one that maybe is going to be I mean, next. Ivan Tony, what bracket would you put him in? Well, yeah, again, in in that sense. Um, very classic number nine, yeah. few and far between, and, and again, getting, you know, why correct. And if if, if he does, which is why, again, the, these are players that are costing top dollar. And yeah. you know, again, we're not talking about parachuting them into those clubs, but certainly, let's say Tony leaves Brentford, there's a vacancy. There you go. There you there you go. go. You know? yeah, well, you, you're not you're not touting him, Connor. You've I'm already got I'm, him. Got I'm him on Brentford commission. Now. I'm on commission. You got him to Brentford already in the summer, but uh, there's no doubt. Would those scenarios play out? And you're a, a mid to lower end Premier League club looking at that type of striker and you're casting your net around the English leagues, a guy who scored 10 in 13 and hopefully will weigh in with a few more between now and the end of the season at a club who are at the upper bracket of the championship. Yeah, he's going to be, sadly, and you know we know there was a, a strong interest from Leeds in the summer and Farker and uh, if, as it would appear likely, he can get them out of the division. Um, you know, I look at them, I look at Bamford. R Rutter is very much not in that mould. So, it, it, for me, it's looking, I suppose, Piro, but he doesn't look to be the most prolific. Ten, though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so if, if you're needing something to supplement Patrick Bamford, um, so we've got him going to Leeds or Brentford now. So, yeah, make, make the most Give of him while you call. can. Give us a make, call, Josh. I mean, we can, make, we can make it happen. Yeah, but... Uh, well, it'll be interesting. I mean, it's like everything with the game, you know, that I saw earlier today about, you know, how... People had declared 4-4-2 is dead and in certain phases of a game state. And you see it with Norwich. You see it with Sargent and Barnes. When they're out of possession, they, they tend to be 4-4-2 in, in terms yeah. of their setup. So there's always this cyclical thing with top-level top, top level football and fads and fashions. And But, yeah, you're right. If, if, I, if you're to stop and think about that type of number nine, they are a, di they are a dying breed. And as a result, their premium the better ones, the ones who can weigh in with goals and that all-round game, are going to be in demand. And, uh, yeah, it's it's an unpalatable truth. But if Norwich don't get up and Josh Sargent has finished on, I don't know, anywhere between 15 and 18 goals, I think they're going to struggle to keep holding. Yeah, agreed. And and just, fi just finally to close this off, I think that is graphic, as I said earlier, graphically illustrated by the top scorers in the Championship this season. Sammy Schmoddux, Morgan Whitaker, Adam Armstrong is, is a nine, but not, I mean, he's... Uh, vertically challenged, isn't he? So I wouldn't call him a complete nine in the same way that Sargent is. Jack Clark, I think, is up there. John Rowe. I mean, these are all kind of wide players, really. Goal-scoring wide players, which again, I mean, you mentioned kind of fashions and trends. Feels like there's a lot more of those in the game now than, than there was. And as a re I don't know if that's as a result of or as a result of coaches moving or the game changing or a, a lack of these players becoming available. But that seems to feel where we are at the moment, which again is why I think Josh Sargent is maybe proving himself to be such a handful because these defenders aren't probably used to dealing with players like him, particularly um, particularly at this level. That probably rounds off part one. We'll come back in part two. We'll speak Boogate, we'll speak season tickets, we'll speak uh, head coach links, all of that to come. And of course, we'll do our Bring the Heat segment as well. See you in a tick.
Welcome back to the Pinkin.com Norwich City podcast brought to you in association with Coleman's of Norwich after a brilliant 4-1 win at Carrow Road over Cardiff after a brilliant week for Norwich City as well. And we are going to uh, bring back our Bring the Heat segment this week. Um, this is, of course, in association with Coleman's, which you can see on all of these lovely retro Norwich City shirts. Thanks to, to Billy, as ever, for uh, allowing us to, to, to use them. Still really like, well, I don't know if I like, it's the white one I like. That's why I was desperately looking for that one. Um, Paddy, I guess we could, we could include the Watford game in this as well, if you like. Over a very productive week, six points, eight goals. Who's stood out? Who's brought the heat for you this week? Well, I mean, you'd say Sergeant, but as we just finished the last segment on Sergeant, that would be very boring to go down that route. So, um, you know, I've I've liked Gabby Zara's performances this week um, because there was this feeling that, that he dropped off, albeit a very highly consistent plane, and he had. You know, the stats tell you that. He went 12 games, I think, without a, a goal contribution, a goal or an assist, having prior to that, been right up there with the Dewsbury Halls and the Somervilles in terms of the championship, not just within Norwich. And, and now he's assist with Kenny McLean's corner routine at QPR last Saturday and then two excellent goals. If you, you, you're you desperate to make out that it was deflected. And it was definitely deflected. I haven't seen it back, but uh, if that's what you say. but uh, I, I've, I've consulted Chris Gore and he, he said it was definitely a deflection. Right, and it massively altered the trajectory. of the. I, I think it's taken it in. In the post, wow, you're being very harsh there, Connor. Well, it's a good. Fr- I'm not saying you're it's not a good. Very harsh, but um, well, do you want to talk up how you, you've basically got an assist for this free kick, haven't you? I, uh, you know what? I've forgotten about that. I did. I did. That is no word of a lie. Say before he, that free kick was taking place, I said he'll score here, and you know, deflected strike or not, the ball went in the back of the net, and then there was a lovely celebration, which has now come to light that uh, would appear him and his partner uh, have some very happy news. T- which he shared there for the first time because that was, by all accounts, the first time the players didn't know anything about that. But uh, a new arrival in the in the Sara household um, at some point, David Wagner suggested that was the case after the game. So congratulations to him and his partner. But uh, yeah, I, I I just think you know you know he's got that quality, and we could stop and probably have another podcast. What happened in that intervening period? Why for twelve games did a man as good as he is at this level? Um, just dry up a little bit and there's probably a lot of factors there and obviously the team's performance as well chiefly among them um, maybe another one like we touched on with Sar- uh, with, sorry with Jack Stacey earlier on maybe a lot of miles on the clock I think I'm right in saying he's played most yeah you know that that's uh, for a guy who's only in his second season in England um, that could be a challenge as well no doubt from a physical output point of view uh, but yeah this past few days I think it's just a reminder to everybody that um Yes, we can talk about Sargent, we can talk about Rowe, but uh, if Norwich are going to get into the top six, Gabby Sarr has to continue in this vein. So I'm glad to report he's brought the heat this week. I love the fact you could drop him into an 80s disco and it just looks so at home with the with the look that he's got. But he's making moustaches cool again, which is excellent. Um, Adam, who's, apart from the person who overturned the heating on in this place, which is like a sauna this week, um, who uh, who brought the heat for you? Uh, I'm sort of toy between the two fullbacks, to be honest, I think. Um... Sam McCallum had a, an excellent game today, which probably won't be spoken about that much. But um, I think it's got to go to <clears throat> to Jack Stacey. We've mentioned him a little bit already on on this podcast. If you, if you look at his performances over the last sort of two three games, it's, um, it feels like he's gone up a level again, and maybe to the levels we know he had in them from you know early on in the season when Norwich fans were saying you know they've effectively replaced Max Aarons. You know we know the quality that that he's got for a guy on a free from from Bournemouth and. Um, yeah, I mean, some assists, some really key assists. And, you know, you mentioned the assist for the sergeant goal today, the third goal, um, the vision and the awareness to know where he was, but also to be in a position, as Paddy mentioned as well, there on the pitch to, to you know, allow him to, to create that is, um, yeah, and I think his defensive work looks better as well. So I think he's the one. I, I could have got Marcelino Nunez as well. It's difficult on a game. There's a lot of honourable mentions. Yeah, it's, it? it feels like it's quite nice, actually, to have this segment and you can you almost conflicted as to where to go. But, um but yeah, I think I'll go with Jack Stacey, uh, but Sam McCallum is the is the honourable mention. Yeah, and uh, as you said, Marcelino Nunez, I think Ashley Barnes is an, is an honourable mention. Onel Hernandez probably as well for, for maybe what he's produced over the last two games. For me, it's got to be David Wagner, hasn't it? I think after what happened in midweek, um, 
definitely bought the heat in terms of his post-match comments around everything that happened. But today probably got the heat in that sense, in terms of what the Carrow Road crowd was. It, it was very much a galvanised together, unified place. And uh, yeah, I think the players were very much appreciative of that. So uh, I'm going to go for David Wagner this week, which Paddy probably ends us on nicely. As I don't want to reflect on this uh, too much because I know it's been spoken about a lot and there some people probably feel like it's it's been magnified maybe more than it should have been, particularly after what Norwich City did on Tuesday, which, you know, it's kind of been lost a little bit, but it was a very good result in the end, even if we kind of mentioned that it was kind of three performances in one game, really, from, from them. Um, your thoughts, reflections, feelings, a few days after the event on everything that happened in terms of Tuesday, um, because it's still difficult to wrap your head around. I think from my perspective, this has been framed in a very interesting way because obviously initially, and, and this was obviously the booing at the double substitution of Josh Sargent and, uh, and Onel Hernandez in, in midweek. Um, Sargent revealed today that it was him actually that wanted to come off. And to be honest, I think it's less, I don't think they were, they were booing the players. I don't think they were booing the players going off or, or coming on. Um, I think they were, it was more, well, it was obviously aimed at David Wagner but I think it was more a message about the direction that he was taking with those, those substitutions, taking a, a striker on, excuse me, throwing on a, a midfielder. I've, I've wondered at points over this week, if he'd have brought Van Hooydonk on for Sargent, would that, would that have happened? I, I don't think it would have. So I think it was more a reflection of maybe the direction, obviously, you know, you, you spoke contextually about the QPR stuff earlier, about what had happened at QPR, but also maybe this kind of conservatism or conservativism. That, that has kind of um, wrapped itself around him uh, in, in, in the last few weeks and months, and understandably so given the position that he's been in. But it, it did kind of expose where maybe the club has got itself into in terms of those fractured relationships. But maybe there's a sense, given what we saw today, that it could maybe be a clearing of the air almost. It, it maybe felt like that today. Yeah, no, I wrote, I wrote in the week and it felt like a bloodletting, but... Um... You never, you couldn't obviously at that point say how it was going to play out. Now we're sat here four-one, very commanding performance, start to finish, total buy-in from the fan base. You know we had Paul Chester and our photographer there uh, at the the point where the team coach flies back in round the, the sort of the access road to the city stand before the game. David Wagner comes off, cheers, and um, some. I'm assuming it was a supportive rather than a wag sort of get us to Wembley, David. Um, but just from the moment he's not even set foot out of the coach and that support was there for him as an individual and the team. Uh, you could feel it in the warm-up as well. Um, just little things, really. You know, like I mean, even like goals were being cheered from Norwich substitutes in that shooting drill they do. I don't recall that happening before. And, you know, 15 minutes in and it's David Wagner's yellow army r rippling around. And then, probably crucially, to go behind... There was no, there was no sense of frustration bubbling to the surface as there was earlier in the week. Um, total support, total buy-in still, and of course, once Josh Sargent levelled, then it was only a matter of how many for me. So, you know, I'm sure David wouldn't have wanted to go down that track, but you know, he he strode into that post-match room on Tuesday night and he wanted to get it off his chest. He wasn't coaxed out of him. He wasn't led down a path he didn't want to go to. He premeditated, was ready to come out with that. He said subsequently at his pre-match for this game that maybe the words he chose were a little too strong and how they were delivered and how they hit were too strong. The only bit that I was, uh, I, I felt, you know, I, I, obviously I only listened. Support, yeah, it? Uh, it, was, it was the stay at home yeah, bit. That yeah, was the bit that I felt it crossed to, the yeah. line. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and I think if he had his time again, yeah, he, he wouldn't frame it quite in those it was terms. emotional. It was, yeah. But as I say, he, I think he knew what he was doing at that point. He's trying to send a message to his players, as much as those fans, that I will have your back and I will be out there and I'll take it. And if that protects you, then so be it. Um, and the fact that now he's, he's turned this other way, I mean, if... if this goes on to end in where we all hope it ends in the Premier League. That will go down as more as almost Freudian piece of psychology. What he's he's pulled off there, um, and he is a very astute individual, and uh, and he would be thinking about his messages and how they hit and when to deliver them as well. Um, and maybe he just felt like, irrespective of all that's wrapped around this club at the minute and the feelings of frustration and some fans who don't feel that they're being represented or that they don't even feel they're valued by senior figures at the football club and we don't need to go into the whys and wherefores of that. We all know what we're talking about there over the last two, three, four years. Um, part of that 
that's for the summer and onwards. That's all wrapped around Ben Napper and his mid to longer term strategy and what that looks like. In the here and now, you've got, as it was prior to today, 14 league games. You're firmly in the mix for the playoffs. Everybody pull together. Let's see if this is achievable. And then we'll worry about whatever else in terms of Norwich City's direction of travel thereafter. And I think that message that he delivered in very forceful terms the other night has hit home, absolutely. You saw the reaction in the ground before the game, during the game, after the game. They just need to ride that wave now. And um, and, and if it turns out you know, they, that they get to where we hope they're going to get to, then um, I think it's a very astute piece of man management from him. And um, I'm sure he wouldn't have wanted to have to go down a route, but... A, but, you know, as he said, when the, the focus was on him specifically and his future, when your back's against the wall, you need to basically come out swinging. And, and that's what he did midweek. And uh, on a human level, did, did he was he in his rights to have a right of reply? Absolutely, because it, it cannot be pleasant, as it wasn't, I'm sure, for Dean Smith prior to to be stood there on a touchline. But in, and this is the, the conflicted nature of it, the disorientating nature of it, watching his team win the game, be winning the game, and then go on to, into the top six at the end of that game. And and yes, yet your in-game elements have been, you know, frustratingly for him, I'm sure, um, analysed, dissected and, and voted on and, and not in a good way. So, um, you know, on a human level, I'm sure he thought enough's enough. And, uh, and that's certainly what it felt like when he delivered his messages after the game. But... Um, yeah, I mean, I felt at the time, once the dust had settled and people started to digest it, maybe the following day, that yeah, maybe it was just that, you know, you, you burst a boil or whatever and then, you know, you move on. And uh, and today's performance and everything that went with it would suggest that everybody has moved on and let's see where it takes us now in the remaining 13 games. Yeah, and you mentioned it's a message that he wanted to deliver, but I think it's quite clear that it's obviously a message that the players wanted to, to deliver as well. I mean, Gabby Sarah post-match and yeah. when, when he was speaking to us and, and subsequently, I mean, and I think, you know, we, we you can cr criticise, we've done on, on podcasts and you can say a lot about this group, but even in those very, very dark spells in autumn, he's had a group there that's that's been playing for him pretty much all the way through, I would say. Certainly a bulk of it, anyway. Yeah, I don't think that's ever been an issue. I mean, your you, mind goes back to the like Sunderland performances and you just think, well, that's almost just... They just seem so rudderless rather than that old cliche term, they've downed tools for him or he's lost the dressing room. I, you know, Even those points in the season, you didn't feel that was the case. Uh, and all the messaging from the players, you know, pre-match, post-match touch points was that isn't the case. You know, very firmly believe in this manager and what he's trying to do. And it just for whatever reason hasn't happened. Remember the Kenny McClay, I can't remember what game it was, but he came out and he was so ashen-faced um, delivering, uh, look, we're doing everything. We're not. We, there's no stone being left unturned. We're working as hard as we possibly can. It's just not clicking. And uh, that was never never an issue, I don't think. And And yeah. And it's worth reiterating as well. And I know, I know, his point's been made. I think you might have made it after the midweek game that it was directed at David Wagner, and it was about David Wagner's template as a coach and his and his principally his substitutions in the last two games. But it isn't really. You can't detach the players. The players are out on the pitch. They're feeling it. They're looking around what's going on here. And you saw that with some of the players. Some of the features of some of the players was like, we can't understand what on earth's going on. What are we doing wrong? So I don't think you could detach that it wasn't directed at the players and it was only directed at David Wagner because they are a collective and that's the message that's come through clearly in the last few days and then particularly today is that there's a collective responsibility with the head coach, his coaching staff, his backroom team and those players. It's not a him and us uh, scenario. It's that dressing room as one trying to drive something forward which ends in, hopefully, success. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, Adam, move, moving away from that, we, we've got majorly hidden uh really it's it, obviously we had the news about the season ticket renewals it's a uh on average i think about a two percent increase um certainly speaking to to people that uh my family who who, who go to carrow road and, and they've said it's around 11 pounds that, that they're seeing in terms of an increase which um i think is it depends on sort of age groups and that but it, it is about or just under a pound a game um but obviously accompanying that news was the news about safe standing and the implementation of this uh Snake Pit, the the Lower Barclay, some in the away end as well. That's clearly a, a plus. So I mean, it, it, on both of those kind of reflections, because you know it's it's a rise. It's already that it was certainly this season. I don't think it will be last season. So I think Middlesbrough has yeah. gone huge in terms of their increase, but um, it, it was the most expensive um, season ticket increase. I think there's a, a willingness from the club to um, you know 
basically get fans used to these incremental rises every every season. What what are your thoughts in terms of that package that they unveiled on on season tickets? I suppose it's up to you know the paying people whether they're happy with the product they're getting on the pitch relative to the price they're paying. But um, I think when you when you know you uh, you assess the loyalty of the Norwich fan base generally, um, it's it's probably up there in terms of loyalty. They they stick with their team through thick and thin and. Um, is that social element? I think you know. You look at it. I know for me personally, from my days as a season holder, you almost kind of, you know, the football was a bonus, but it it was that element of meeting up with people that you know you support the same team as you. You have that bond with them, and then you can, you know, you look forward to your Saturday afternoon. And I think when you take that away from them, it's almost like what do I go and do? So, uh, you know, given the inflation rate, it is below that. So as, as someone pointed out yesterday on the preview show, so it's probably a fair um, rise, and I can understand it. You know, the club is gonna lose the parachute payments they need to try and fit you know fill these financial holes that that will become you know obvious to them uh, moving into the summer so a small rise they'd hope probably that most fans will stick with them and um, given that they've then got the safe stand element which they're not going to get any financial benefit from it is purely been put in for the supporters to help increase the atmosphere um, it's something that I'm sure many fans would have yearn for for many years you go to somewhere like Tottenham I think they've got it I remember going in the away and there and they've got it and it feels you know much safer when you're kind of celebrating goals and you know you've got that kind of added security of a barrier and I think during games it will hopefully you know if you get the group of supporters together that want to generate that atmosphere then if they can all be together in an environment that's safe surely that's going to be a, a huge plus for Norwich particularly when you look at recent games that unity and the atmosphere can really help the team on the pitch, you know, you go back to Tuesday when there was that turn in atmosphere, the players almost lost their heads where, you know, you look at today, they're 1-0 behind, the fans are fully behind them, the atmosphere's good and you knew they were going to go and turn the game around. So that's only a plus moving forwards. Um, so, yeah, I think it, it's a good good move by the club to introduce that um, and be one of the kind of leaders, I suppose, in English football in terms of bringing it in. I know there's a few clubs like Shrewsbury and uh, I think QPR and Tottenham and Celtic and a few other places that have got it. But, um Certainly in this part of the world, they're, they're going to be the first club to do it. So, yeah, credit where credit's due. And um, let's see you know, what happens next season with that in place. And um, I think the atmosphere will be good. There was a section at the start of his answer. I thought he was going to say enjoyed spending time with us, but we didn't We didn't get to that. But it's all right. I'll let you off. Um, yeah, it's uh, and, and, and to be fair as well, I think they're uh, brilliant that the, that the club did today with the rainbow uh, stuff in terms of all the signage for the, for the um, LGBT. Um, Q plus community that was that was excellent as well i think it's um history month i think uh, i want to get that right so that that's a, a, a major positive as well and to be fair and we saw this with the mental health video and other kind of initiatives that they've done they are a football club who gets stuff like that right and and obviously you know the, the safe standing element as well is um is very positive and i think there's going to be plans to try and move the drum a bit more central and sit hopefully that obviously then can have a, a two-way impact in terms of the direction of travel and atmosphere which which obviously will be good and the fact that we're going to see that next season i think is a a major boost speaking of, of next season paddy um some reports this week about arsenal assistant Carlos Cuesta, which is hard to say without using a, a Spanish accent, um, that appears nationally. Um, your thoughts? I mean, it's, it's interesting. For me, there's there's lots of interesting elements to this, but for me, the most interesting is the timing element of it because, um, you know, let's be honest, he's, he's not a new name. It's not a name that was new to us particularly. Um, you know, and obviously when, when you do the job that we do, you get told lots of stuff and it's it's impossible, near on impossible to, to write stories or stand up all of the stuff that you, you get told about. But um, it's interesting that now is the point that it's, it's surfaced, I felt, after particularly after the week that, that Norwich City have had off the pitch. Uh, why why the timing for you then, Connor? Just suspicious about it. <laughs> right, OK. Is that your general nature? I'm just a very suspicious person. Yeah, well, I mean... Who knows which uh, which uh, recess that, that emerged from that news. I mean, Arteta was asked about it and played it fairly straight back, didn't it? His presser. Um, I think from what I can read into it with this guy, this I mean, the backstory is something else. You know, he's 28 years of age. He played in the Balearics back in Spain with Marco Asensio, but he didn't feel he was going to be much better than a lower level player in Spain. So he went full on to the coaching sort of vibe at a very early age and I think he was in at Juventus was it um, one of the Spanish clubs was it Atletico Madrid I'm not yes. yeah and um, and then just met 
uh, Arteta when he went on a study visit to sort of see Guardiola at Man City and that's where the connection so you know a real kind of uh, modern day progressive okay. yeah, yeah essentially and um, you know you see one or two of these dotted about now don't you that Will Still in France who's doing some very eye catching things and you know, even domestic coaches. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Yeah, uh, Manning who who left. Um, yeah. yeah, and um, yeah. Uh, so my reading of it, looking at him, is he wants to be a manager. That's evident because you don't go on that trajectory and then just plateau as, albeit at Arsenal, but as an Arsenal assistant coach, he will feel he wants to. Uh, I'm assuming, um, for, if you piece all the pieces together about his career path. Uh, he wants to be a coach and uh, that report that was in the Guardian said you know a number of championship clubs will be looking at him so I think it's reasonable to assume then you overlay the most important element in this which is the Arsenal connection with Ben Napa he would know all about him and likewise Cuesta would know all about Ben Napa they'd work very closely together in many areas and uh, it's a union you could see um, but you know, I don't think Norwich would be the only suitors if this guy decides. And, and maybe a lot of this will be what happens with Arsenal. You know, they came so close last season, just fell short. You know, would 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 it need Arsenal to, to go on and lift something trophy-wise, ideally the Premier League, before he felt it was unfinished? It was finished business for him there. Is there a natural parting for him and Arteta come the summer? Um, all that will, will come out in due course. But I think I was sat in this very chair when me and you had a quite a healthy debate you were playing devil's advocate was, yeah. when we were saying why persist with David Wagner and you know all joking aside we kind of mapped out that well maybe Ben Napper's man isn't available in the here and now which we're going back I don't know what it was about a month six weeks ago you know maybe that's why um, contrary to maybe the sense that they weren't completely aligned in, in many areas um, why we, he would retain faith in David Wagner in the here and now and if it is a scenario that it, it's potentially because, you know, he would have identified certain individuals and they're not going to be available in, in the January, February of this year, but might be in the summer, then that's why. So, um, yeah. And, and of course, we can't say anything definitive right here, right now, because David Wagner may lead Norwich to the Premier League. What scenario plays out then? If, if he has taken Norwich to the Premier League, do you say, see you later? I mean, that would be a very... <laughs> Very brutal um, departure. I mean, they, you know, we talk about Daniel Farker in the dressing room at Brentford after winning a game was brutal, but in the dressing room at Wembley, would be wow, well, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, on the on the open top bus, taking his champagne, yeah, right, David, you won't yeah, be needing yeah. that. You don't need to go on the balcony, <laughs> David. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, who knows? It is football after all. But uh, so that's why I think you know both from that element, but also from this guy and, and Arsenal, and there's so much to play out in their respective seasons from here so I don't think you can say anything definitive it's it's a it's a managerial potential candidate Ben Napper would know all about so you know why wouldn't he be linked I mean that's fairly evident to me um, given you would feel he would be very much aligned because they've both been schooled in in that Arsenal sort of system um, so we'll we'll see but uh, yeah in the here and now the timing is is a strange one I, I can't see how that would serve any benefit from a Norwich perspective. I've seen theories about, well, it might aid the season ticket renewal take up, but that, se that seems very that's a Taylor Swift conspiracy. Yeah, though, isn't yeah, it? that's that, that's not for me that one. So it feels more Arsenal end of the, of the equation, and um, maybe just a, a fishing exercise. See what other clubs might put their hand up and say, yeah, we'd like to have a chat with you if if you were available. And uh, but as I say, we'll, we'll know in very short order. I think in the next few months how it's looking for David Wagner and Norwich and how it's looking for him maybe at Arsenal as well because you know, now, now that's out there now, it's going to be very hard to put that one back in the box, I think. And um, you know, if, if he seriously doesn't have any coaching and head coaching aspirations at this stage, we'll probably hear that from him, I would have thought, because he wouldn't want that distraction. So, yeah, it's uh, not a surprising link, but um, certainly didn't, didn't impact on David Wagner or his team today. So uh, I don't think, I think it will die down now and, and go away because as has been proven again today now, talking, filtered it through the fan element of midweek, but that seems to me to have been put back together and, and, and it's now all about Norwich, David Wagner, 13 games, can you get in the top six? And then if you get there, can you go all the way? And that's what it's about. And anything else is peripheral and frankly irrelevant. Yeah, agreed. And I mean, the only thing I would add to that is that sporting directors are 
here really and and not and they exist because they look to the long term so they always supposedly are supposed to have short lists of coaches that they would be ready to move for in the event that uh, a head coach gets hit by a bus or whatever or something happens someone comes and takes them so um it could just be part of that process i think it's it's worth adding that as well not that, that you know, we, we 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 would say definitively either way um that probably does us nicely for this week's show. Thank you, gents. Thank you all very much for watching, stroke listening. Of course, if you listen, you can watch us uh, on YouTube if you'd rather see our glorious set in its full um, glory. And if you if you if you watch, you can also listen if you uh, have had enough of our faces. Oh yeah, and we've got we had a delivery as well. So I don't know who inside um, our, our HQ delivered these to our podcast studio but uh these are quite vintage aren't they i think they they used to appear you've got some in your house yeah Yeah, yeah. so uh there we go and it says the pink and always on the ball you can be the judge of that (laughs) stop (laughs) stop (laughs) i can see the comments stop typing it um and uh, we will see you we get enough yeah yeah, we're too miserable we're not miserable enough yeah all of that's usual stuff um we will leave it there for this week thank you very much for joining us we'll see you post blackburn next week and hopefully we are talking again about some more norry city momentum see you soon